Hi there. This is the fourth lesson in the series that I'm calling Buckling the Belt of Truth, and this one is about resisting Satan. All of the Buckling the Belt episodes are scattered throughout the Bible reading calendar. This episode will be folded in at episode 219. You can find this episode and all the other Buckling the Belt episodes by searching for the word buckling at dailybiblereading.info. Searching for that word might also work in your podcast app. One advantage of looking for this episode at dailybiblereading.info is that there is a PDF attached. After searching for answers in the Bible and reading a few books that talked about the topics we read about in the lessons number one through three, I found myself still bothered and worried because I couldn't seem to experience the level of victory that others talked about. I'll tell my story today about how the Lord gave me the answer to my problem by showing me how to resist Satan. Satan is alive and well. Yes, there are demons. Satan himself probably doesn't have time to bother you or me directly, but he leads an army of evil spirits. They will not want you to listen to this podcast. Please try to push through their opposition. The more you feel interference and oppression, the greater is your need for the information I will share. Because I'm concerned that we get a good start on this topic, and with the hope that you will be able to listen to this podcast to the end, I would like you to pray this prayer based on Ephesians 6 along with me. Lord God, give us strength to stand firm. Help me and my listener wear all of the spiritual armor you have given to us so that we can stand against Satan and his forces. Please remind us that we're always wearing the breastplate of righteousness because Jesus died and was raised to life and he has given us right standing in your sight. Help us to keep on the boots of the gospel, being ready to share the good news about Christ, whether people are eager to hear it or not. May we always wear the belt of truth, realizing who we are in unity with you. Let us never let go of our shield, which is fully believing in you. May we always realize that we have the helmet of salvation because we know you have saved us. Help us to know the word of God and to use it as our sword, not to hurt people, but to tell the truth in a spirit of love. And help us never to forget that our instant connection to you is prayer. Make our love grow for our fellow believers, and may Jesus find us among those who are blameless and holy when he comes. Amen. The existence of Satan and his dark forces is something that those same forces normally seek to suppress. That's why so many in today's Western culture can read the whole Bible and never notice that we have a living and dangerously powerful enemy. Satan first appears in Genesis 3, then his work is visible in the Old Testament in the kingdoms of man opposed to God and his people, and in the persistent, seemingly unconquerable desire of humans to worship idols, which actually represent demons. Take a close look at the things demon worshipers did in the Old Testament 
and you will see the same evil things in our culture today, including such things as male and female prostitution and the killing of babies. Then in the New Testament, Satan is personally revealed, starting with Jesus being tempted by him and with Jesus directly teaching about him. If you were to cross out every page in the New Testament that mentions Satan, evil spirits, or believers somehow struggling against the dark forces, you wouldn't have very many pages left. The book of Revelation would be totally missing. So, we have an enemy, and he's not nice. I want you to know that as a Christian, If you believe in Jesus and are united with him, you cannot be possessed by Satan or one of his demons. But Christians can be oppressed, harassed. These things are not the same as what we call mental disease. But I believe we are unwise to think that there is no spiritual component in such things as depression, suicidal ideation, gender dysphoria, schizophrenia, and all the rest. I suggest that if we don't deal with the root causes of such things, which often can be demons, we will only be able to medicate ourselves in an attempt to deal with the symptoms. My topic today, therefore, comes with a big caution label, which I will read to you now. Many followers of Christ will be able to use the scriptures and books I will suggest without outside help and see increasing victory over evil desires and sinful habits of thinking. I suggest you start with my recommended resources, especially The Seven Steps for Freedom in Christ by Neil T. Anderson. But if you encounter stiff spiritual opposition, please seek the help of a professional Christian counselor or a loving group of believers who will encourage you, pray with you, and help you stay accountable. One basic problem for me was that I thought Christians should not verbally rebuke the devil. Because the archangel Michael did not do so in the story Jude relates, Jude verse 9. He told Satan, may the Lord rebuke you. But there are several key ways my hesitancy was wrong. First, we are commanded at least three times in the New Testament to resist Satan. I'll read two of them now. The first one, 1 Peter 5 verses 8 and 9 in the NLT. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. James 4, 7 in the NLT. So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I have been using the word Satan so far, and the devil is the same person. Secondly, resisting the devil or Satan and forbidding his minions speaking to you is not the same as the prideful insulting of spiritual powers that Jude was speaking against. And third, as we have seen in previous readings, we are now adopted as children of God. We are now unified with Jesus. This means that we have quite a different and better position than angels. Footnote. There is some kind of legal permission that has been granted when a demon has established a stronghold in someone. This is that oppression that I talked about. Because of that, unless the person being harassed is your own young child, it will not be appropriate for you to command the demon to leave that other person. 
Yes, I know the Apostle Paul did that in Acts 16, and Jesus certainly had that authority in Luke 8. But please don't try to cast out someone else's demons. The response can get ugly. However, you do have the legal authority to resist and forbid demonic influences harassing you. Because of your unity with Christ, you can rescind permission that was somehow previously given, perhaps by a reaction to some event or trauma or word perhaps long ago and even perhaps forgotten by you. Our authority over satanic forces operating in our lives comes directly from who we are in Christ. It's so important to know who you are. If you see yourself as a weak and sinful person who is continually not able to control sinful thoughts, then that's who you will be. But if you've done your previous homework to buckle the belt of truth, believing that you are forgiven, loved by God, and joined as one with Him, then you're on the road to finding victory. Who we believe ourselves to be will be shown in our lives. Don't believe Satan's lies. So let me tell you how that worked out for me. We had been working among the Oria people for about nine years, and I was in the village of Gwai leading the men working with me in translating Philippians. Two Oria boys were staying with me at night since Gail was not with me. It was Pentecost time, and there were several extra-church meetings. In one of them, the pastor, Jakub, led a hymn in the national language, too high, too slow, and sounding like a dirge. I said to him after the service, there's no joy in these hymns. And in rare candor, he replied, Yeah, you're right. There's no joy in these hymns. So I suggested, how about if I write several songs in the Oreo language to sing at the Sunday service? And he agreed. Starting that night, the boys and I put together three catchy little songs with melodies you could clap your hands with. On Sunday, I cajoled the congregation to clap their hands while singing them. It wasn't easy to get them to do it because clapping was never done in that church. But they finally got into it, and I have pictures of the smiles that resulted. Being a musician, I had tried introducing Oria worship songs before, but this was my first success. The boys and I created eight more songs over the next ten days. Then one Monday morning when the translation team came to work, they told me, Laborina had a dream and you were in it. She's going to come this afternoon at five to tell you about it. That day I could hardly wait for five o'clock to finally come. But I want to admit, and I want you to remember, that there was a tinge of worry in my waiting. I was thinking, Oh no, what if her dream reveals something sinful in me? Laborina was the oldest widow in the village. She was also respected for her knowledge of traditional Oria songs. She came right on time and told me her dream. It was evening in my dream. It was dark and people were cooking in their kitchens. Then all of a sudden there was a bright light in the direction of the sunrise. The light was so bright that it put out all the cooking fires and lanterns. We all went outside to see what was happening. You were there, too, she said to me. So we asked you, what's that? And you said, that's got to be Jesus coming. And then you taught us this song. And here it is. Be on, and ho, and come, kiegwe an. Be on, 
en ho en kam ki e gwe an, kwa sang, kwa sang, kam ye. I didn't waste any time in writing down the melody and the words of the song that I had sung in her dream. Later, the boys and I added two more verses, and it became one of our worship songs. Then I did a stupid and prideful thing. I said to the Lord, Hey, I'm the missionary here. How about giving me a dream? Bad idea. I don't recommend being flippant with the Lord, especially if your prayer is laced with pride. I think it was the same night that the Lord gave me the dream I will never forget. I was in bed at night, laying on my side. I could see out of the window with a lacy curtain that was directly across from me, and the moon was full. I could see an Oria man with an Afro haircut walking across the yard coming toward my house, He turned his flashlight on sparingly. His batteries were almost spent, and it gave a very orange glow. I wondered if any of the ladies in the village were due to give birth. Maybe he was going to call me to some medical emergency. He stepped up on my porch, and because the house was built on stilts, the floor shook. There was an exercise bike on the porch in front of the window, and he got on and pedaled a few turns. Turning the wheel activated a light on the front of the bike that shone in my window. As he lazily turned the wheel a few times more, I was beginning to not like this guy. He dismounted and came right up to the window pointed his flashlight inside, and turned it on. At that distance, I knew that he could see me through the curtain. I was overcome with irrational fear, and with great effort yanked my pillow from under my head and covered my face. I was drenched in sweat. And only, and only then did I realize, hey, I don't have a glass window in my bedroom. There's no lace curtain, and there definitely is no exercise bike with a generator light on the front anywhere in the province. Now, I often have unmemorable nightmares. If I'm about to be eaten by a large cat or crocodile, the interpretation is that I need to get up and go to the bathroom. Recently, I was even threatened by three turkeys. The nightmare I just related held two important lessons for me. I will tell only the first one in this lesson and save the second one for the next Buckling the Belt episode. I somehow knew that the man with the flashlight was evil. Could he represent an evil spirit? That same night, before going back to sleep, I humbly asked the Lord if he would show me if my dream indicated that there was an evil spirit somehow involved with me. The Lord did not keep me waiting very long for his answer. Right away he allowed me to hear my tempter's voice. The demon only needed to whisper two words, and my mind went off on an evil trip, one that I had traveled thousands of times before. It's too shameful for me to tell you what the trip led to. Just imagine that it is like your own worst sinful lusts. Only a couple of weeks later, while that experience was still fresh in my mind, I was back with our family in the provincial capital of Jayapura. At the English-speaking worship service, attended by most missionaries with children in the school there, the sermon was given by a retired missionary who had come back for a visit, Jim Sunda. Jim told how the Lord had unexpectedly given a ministry of deliverance to him and his wife in their home church in the States. 
He told stories of people being freed from demonic oppression and ended by saying that on Monday he would have time for anyone who wanted to talk with him. I was the first one to approach him at the end of the service. On Monday morning, when I met with Jim, we sat across a small dining room table and he asked several questions. I told him exactly why I thought I was being tempted by a demon. We gave the demon a title, Demon of X. I'll probably tell you the actual title we gave that demon in the next lesson. Footnote. Never ask a demon to speak or to tell you his name. Jim explained the legal situation I explained above. He would not rebuke the demon directly, but he would suggest the words for me to pray to God first and then to speak directly to Demon of X to forbid that evil spirit from doing anything with me. The prayer of confession and repentance that Jim led me through was relatively easy. But when we got to the step of forbidding the demon, he told me to look him directly in the eyes. With some effort, I focused my eyes on his, but then quickly looked away. I objected that the archangel Michael didn't rebuke the devil. He answered me like what I said above. Scripture explicitly commands us to resist Satan. Okay, I had to admit that he was right, so we proceeded through the next step. Looking in Jim's eyes, I followed his suggestions, finding my voice, forbidding Demon X to come to me, to harass me, to tempt, whisper, or bother me in any way. We also forbid him from bothering other members of our families, and we commanded him, You go where Jesus sends you. Immediately afterward, I didn't feel like anything had happened to me. But when I got to my Jeep to go home, a voice whispered, That was a real good thing you just did. Here's the tricky thing. It was a good thing for me to get right with God. But I recognized this message as a temptation to pride. Oh no, I thought, now another voice is tempting me. Jim already had a couple with him. So, using the rear-view mirror of that jeep, I looked myself in the eyes and resisted that demon of pride audibly. For the next three days, I made repeated trips to the bathroom in order to use the mirror there to look myself in the eyes. It seemed that the old demon was totally gone, but that he left his folder on me in the hands of others. Once or twice I had to smile, because the new ones knew the right words to tempt me, but their timing was terrible. By the way, rebuke and resist demons verbally, audibly. As far as anyone knows, they can't hear silent rebukes. I was rejoicing because at last I felt free. Of course, immediately I confessed everything to Gail. On the third day she came to me. My total honesty moved her to confess things that she had held back from ever telling me before. We at last were truly unified in our marriage and in forgiveness toward each other. For years I'd been praying that our work among the Oria people would not just be a wasted effort. There were lots of ways the Oria people were clearly enslaved to demons including miracle-working shamans and a perverted cult that did shameful things. Now that I was free, the Lord allowed me to help set others free among the Oria people, doing the same steps I will recommend to you.
One of the things Jim encouraged me to do daily was to pray through putting on the armor of God in Ephesians 6. I followed his advice for a few weeks. It may have helped, but I began to realize that putting the armor on had just become one of my morning rituals. It was like magic words that I was saying, but we Christians are not given magic words to repeat. And then, not long after that, I saw that the pieces of armor are actually pillars of our belief in God. These pieces of armor reveal who we are in Christ, and therefore a Christian can never take off his or her armor. I also began searching for how we actually put on our spiritual armor. I like the way our Indonesian translation helps readers to understand how the various parts of the armor are actually applied or picked up and worn. An English translation that shows how our plain Indonesian translation conveys those concepts is found at the bottom of the episode notes. And it is basically the same way I led us in prayer at the start of this episode. And now, it's time for me to give you the resources that I promised. I recommend two books by Neil T. Anderson. The foundational bestsellers are Victory Over the Darkness and The Bondage Breaker. Get your hands on the newest revised versions. They're also available as ebooks. The subtitle for Victory Over the Darkness is Realizing the Power of Your Identity in Christ. I would characterize this book as way better and more complete than the things I've shared in my first three lessons for Buckling the Belt of Truth. The Bondage Breaker has the subtitle Overcoming Negative Thoughts, Irrational Feelings, and Habitual Sins. If you're new to this whole topic I've been sharing today, and if you agree that you're struggling against sinful thoughts or irrational feelings, if you're ashamed of habitual sins as I was, or if you know that some sudden impulses seem to come from someone other than yourself, in the pages of this book you'll find that you are not alone and you're not crazy. Somewhere in the 12 chapters of The Bondage Breaker, or the first one, Victory Over the Darkness, you'll find someone like you who was set free from spiritual bondage. The seven steps to freedom in Christ that I've mentioned are found in the appendix of The Bondage Breaker. They are also easily found on the internet and downloadable for free, and I'm placing a link to them here in the episode notes. Each step will ask targeted questions and will lead you through some written prayers. It took me a little over an hour the other day to pray through all the seven steps. If you don't have time to read either of the two books suggested above, I urge you to work through the steps to freedom in Christ. As I prepared for this podcast, right now it's the summer of 2023, I read a follow-up book by Neil T. Anderson, The Bondage Breaker, The Next Step, copyright 1991 and revision 2011. This book shares research findings about the success of Anderson's counseling method. Plus, each chapter shares the testimony of someone who has been released from spiritual bondage. The end of the book gives information about the international scope of Freedom in Christ Ministries. There's a wealth of teaching materials available— training seminars, and many other books are available at their site, Freedom in Christ Ministries, FICM.org. 
If you want to contact me, please use the contact button in the top menu bar of dailybiblereading.info or dailygntbiblereading.info. Dear listener, I will be praying for you. May the Lord bless you real good.